of that. And we have Jonathan's, oh, whatever, I'm sorry. De Silva is here. Matt is here. Jonathan's not here yet. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, we are recording, so let's set up from current slide and get my pen organized. Okay, the one other announcement I wanted to make, uh, but I wanted to make sure this was on Screencast-O-Matic and YouTube, was that uh, the student course evaluations are now open, okay? If you've read your email, you've probably seen about it. You see how to log in, that kind of stuff. If you have any questions, please see me. You can do it anytime between now and the end of the term, but don't wait till the end of the term and then forget about it. Okay, I know at the end of a term it's so easy. By the time you finish all those finals and all those papers and everything else and all that sleepless night and everything else, it's real easy to forget about. Oh, I haven't done the student course evaluation. So rather than risking that, do it sooner rather than later. But if you want to wait and see what that final exam looks like and how miserable it is and that kind of stuff, you can wait till then, but please don't forget to do the student course evaluations. Okay? And then the one other thing, I know that the, eight, uh, the CAP exams were being given today. I don't know how much longer they are. They may be tomorrow or two. I, don't, I can't remember. I saw some email about them, but I didn't. I wasn't at a place where I could print it, so I didn't print it, so I, I don't have that uh, in front of me. So if you were scheduled to take that, please get that taken. Those are valuable pieces of things. But also the student course evaluations. Those are really important for uh, each of us as instructors because we get decent feedback from you all the time, but we get really good when it's anonymous, <laughs> okay, and you're not trying to say something to please us that, you know, please do those. But even better than that, or more so than that, I'm also the math department chair, so I use those evaluations to measure how the student faculty members are doing when I have to evaluate them at the end of the term. So please get them done and do them thoroughly, accurately, you know, precisely, you know, whatever you can to, to give me the best idea of your instructors. And then the other thing, in addition to the courses, like this course or any other course you may be taking in mind, you're probably asked to do one or two other related kind, not really related, but other evaluations like uh, library services or, you know, admission pop practices or uh, registration procedures or, you know, I don't know, cafeteria, whatever it is, those other things they have out there, please do those as well because typically that's the the major source of feedback they get. They don't get to see you every day and interact with you every day and get one-to-one -one feedback. They want to, they basically count on you giving the feedback there so they'll know how they can improve if that's called for. All right, any questions over anything we've done so far? Okay, we're in Chapter 4, Section 4.3. Um, Chapter 4 is higher order differential equations. 4.3 is homogeneous linear equations with constant coefficients. And we're on page 134, example 2, an initial value problem. So here's what the problem is. Solve this 4y double prime plus 4y prime plus 17y is equal to 0. Given that y of 0 is equal to negative 1 and y prime of 0 is equal to 2. Okay. Jonathan's here, so we've got our faithful four, our resident students. We've got the two that are trying to do it remotely, and I can't uh, may, unless I've missed an email or something recently, I haven't heard from them 
recently at all. But I didn't get a chance to do too many emails over the weekend, Easter weekend and stuff. We were out of town, so I didn't get to do much. But I'll check and see if there's anything pending there. This is on page 134, example two near the bottom of the page. Where would you begin in a problem like this? Second. Okay, that's called the auxiliary equation. And what does that become? 4m squared plus 4m plus 17 equals 0. Okay? Do you have any gut feelings about this so far? Okay, we'll proceed. Where would you go from there? Quadratic formula, exactly. And what would that give you? M is equal to? A little louder. I heard something. Minus 4 plus or minus the square root of? Four squared, which is 16, minus 4 times 4 times 17. Any gut feelings now? Over, which is 8. Okay. Any gut feelings yet? You don't have to. We can go on, proceed. What does that give us? Minus 4. Plus or minus the square root of, yep, someone help me out with the calculator. It's not going to be zero, but it will be negative. That was the gut feeling I was looking for. Uh, is it 256? Yeah, minus 256. Did I do that right in my head? I think I did. Okay, now, <clears throat> what about that? 256 is a perfect square, isn't it? Minus 4 plus or minus 256 is a perfect square of 16, isn't it? I, right? Because it's minus 1 is I over 8, which is what? negative one half plus or minus two i by that everybody in agreement okay now just making sure we haven't done this one before so we don't have to do this from scratch but here we have complex conjugate roots if you go back Basically, one page. I may not even have to do that, but um, you see, you can write. And, oh, and by the way, what is that M anyway? Okay, so we got yeah, and M one would be equal to negative one half plus 2i, and m2 is equal to negative 1 half minus 2i, okay? But what are those anyway? <clears throat> where, where, where did you come up with that m anyway, that m thing? Okay, what does that give you? Your y1 would be e to the minus one-half plus two i, right, x, and y2 would be e to the minus one-half minus two i, x, right, which your general solution would then be y is equal to c1 e to the minus one half x e to the two i x i'm writing this a couple different ways so you'll recognize it when you see it other ways 
plus c2 e to the minus 1 half x e to the minus 2 i x. Different ways you can write it. Okay, but that's what we, we've come down to. But we don't really like those i's in there, do we? Okay. So if you had flipped back that one page and looked at Euler's formula, formula, and actually turn back to the page we're on, okay, top of the page there, uh, 134, you'll see that you can rewrite this as Okay, you see your y1 there? Okay, now, now, okay, don't get too carried away there. They've done some substitution there that, that you don't want to, to be messing with. But look at the equation 8. That's the best place to look. There's equation 8, okay? So there you have that y is equal to c1. Now, e to the alpha x... What is your alpha here? Negative one half. So that would be e to the minus x over two, right? Cosine, and what's your beta? Second. Okay. Your beta, yeah. Second? Okay. Yeah. Your, yeah. Your cosine, okay. E to the I beta X is cosine beta X. So that would be cosine 2X, right? Is that what you're saying? I couldn't hear. Okay. plus C2 e to the minus x over 2, that stays the same, sine 2x. Got it? Okay. Now, where do we go from there? That's your general generic formula equation. Then you use your... Um, Boundary values are initial value, yeah. Okay? So y of 0, that's when x is equal to 0, would be c1. And what's e to the 0? 1, okay? Cosine. And what's that? Yeah, what's 2? What's the cosine of 0? Say again. 1, okay, so that's also a 1, okay, so C1 times 1 times 1, okay, plus C2 times 1 times 0, okay, so the C2 isn't part of the picture anymore, you just got C1, okay, Right? Okay, and we know that y of 0 is equal to minus 1. So c1 is equal to minus 1. How about, um, what do we have to do next? What's that? Notice up here, your second initial condition. Yeah, but what is zero? You do your first derivative. So you have to take your first derivative. So there's your y. What's your y prime? Okay, we've got a c1 in there. Say that again now. 
Okay. All right. You know, we've got a product rule here going. Are you, what are you doing? The cosine first? Okay. Uh, so I'm going to write down the... Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you got a 2 there from the chain rule of the cosine. You got an e to the minus x over 2 because that was your function that you left alone. Derivative of a cosine is minus sine, so I put the minus out there, sine of 2x, right? Okay, that's the part 1 of part 1, okay? Now we've got part 2 of part 1, which is, I'm just going, yeah, okay. It's going to be another minus, but this time it's 1 half of c1, because it's the derivative of that one e to the minus x over 2. And that's the time cosine of 2x. Right? Now, part 1 and part 2. Okay. Next. Plus 2 c2 e to the minus x over 2 cosine 2x minus 1 half c2 e to the minus x over 2 sine of 2x, right? All right, now we plug in a 0 for x. So y prime of 0 is equal to... All right, let's take this as painlessly as possible. A 0 here is going to make that 0, so let's forget about it. Okay. A 0 here and here will make both of those... Zero here will make it one. Zero here will make it one. Okay. So you just have a minus one half C one. Okay. A zero here. Those will be one. So it's a plus two C two. And the zero. And the last one, C, okay, forget about that. But we already know what C1 is, a minus 1. So this will be um, 1 half, because the minus times minus is plus, plus 2 C2 by that. Why is this doing such stupid things? Okay. And that is equal to 2, right? Because of our initial condition up here. Okay. So that tells me if I subtract to 1 half from both sides, that gives me 2. Okay. Okay. I think I'll divide everything by 2 and make that 1 fourth plus C2 is equal to 1. So C2 is equal to 3 fourths. Do you buy that? Okay. So there we have our C2. So now our final solution, Y, is equal to... Um, minus e to the minus x over 2. My e didn't show up. Where is the e? Okay, evidently it's not writing well down there, so I'm going to erase some of this because it's just not writing. And where will I write it? Here, maybe. y is equal to... Yuck! This is so aggravating. A minus e to the minus x over 2 
cosine 2x plus 3 quarters, that's the C2, e to the minus x over 2 sine 2x. Okay, that's what I got the answer to be. Let's see what they got it to be. There it is. Y is equal to, okay, they pulled out the e to the minus x over 2, which is fine, leaving them minus cosine 2x plus 3 quarters sine 2x. Fine. Okay. It's a different way to write it. Okay. Um, in the figure you see there, 4.3.1, we see that the solution is oscillatory, but as y approaches 0, the x approaches, no, I'm sorry, but y approaches 0 as x approaches uh, infinity. Uh, basically, they take this one and graph it, and really the, the winner here is this one. As x approaches infinity, e to the minus x over 2 is going to 0. This just gives you oscillations that start off big and then get smaller and smaller and smaller. This wins. That's basically your uh, amplitude function. And the amplitude is getting away from 0. Okay? So you, have, you get that kind of shape. Now, they say two equations worth knowing. Okay? Um, I'll write them down for you and one of them's pretty reasonable I think and useful and all that kind of stuff if you have this as a differential equation y double prime plus k squared y is equal to zero and y double prime minus k squared y is equal to 0. Okay? Now, you can go through everything we just went through, okay? But you'll see it comes out much easier this way. Your m equation, as Matt called it, was your uh, m squared plus k squared equals 0. So m is equal to plus or minus ki, right? And on the other one, it's m is equal plus or minus k. Okay, so when it's, uh, your alpha here is zero because you don't have a uh, real part of that equation. You just have an imaginary part because your B is zero here. Uh, then this one produces Y is equal to C1 cosine KX plus C2 sine Kx. Okay? Uh, whereas your other one the, with the minus sign in there, you would come up with, and this is the form I like to leave it in, y is equal to C1 e to the Kx plus C2 e to the minus kx. Okay? And to me, that is a perfectly fine, beautiful, simple, straightforward result. But they like to do this, and if any one of you are in a major that you're going to use these typically, then be used to this. You can rewrite this as y is equal to c1 hyperbolic cosine kx plus c2 hyperbolic sine kx. Okay? Now, I don't see why I replace a simple exponential function with two hyperbolic sine functions that have nothing to do with sines and cosines anyway, but they're just another function. But some people like them better than those 
So those are two equivalent points. So they just said you might need to know those. If so, go for them, use them, whatever. Okay. To me, the exponential form is far superior, but that's just me. All right, what if you had higher order equations? Okay, we've just been doing dealing with pretty much second order equations so far, but the whole chapter is higher order. What if they're higher than second? Um, then you just keep raising your m's. Okay, um, and you'll wind up with a an auxiliary equation. I think. Isn't that what they're calling these? I think they are. Yeah, auxiliary equation. Okay. Um, and it'll look something like this. A sub n, m to the n plus a sub n minus 1, m to the n, uh, n minus 1, plus a sub n minus 2, X, or, I'm sorry, m to the n minus 2, that's an n, plus dot, 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 plus a sub 2 m squared plus a sub 1 m plus a sub 0 is equal to 0. Okay, something like that. Okay, now. Remember, now we're using these constants. These coefficients are strictly constants. They're not variables anymore. We did those earlier, done that for a while. We'll come back to it later. But now they're just constants. Okay? Now, if you remember back in Math 112 or whenever, wherever you had this kind of stuff, you had ways for finding zeros of a of a uh, polynomial equations. I don't know if you remember all those little tools. We had the Cartes rule of signs that told you how many positive and negative real roots you could expect. We had uh, the rational zeros test that you know gave you ideas of ones to choose from. We used synthetic division a lot. We did lots of things to try to find those roots for m, the values for m. Use them, whatever they are. Uh, if all the roots in that equation are real and distinct, then your solution is going to be y is equal to c1 e to the m1 x plus uh, c2 uh, e to the m2 x plus C3 e to the M3x plus dot 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 plus C4 I mean C N minus 2 e to the N minus M minus 2 X yeah Bob yeah keep on going uh, and you get them all okay Okay, uh, you you just list as many of them as have, and finally you know plus dot 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 plus c to the n e to the n, m sub n x. Okay, okay. So we go all the way down to the last one. Now. If you remember, you may have multiple multiplicities of some of these and then those they gave us our issues with uh, e to the mx and x e to the mx and x squared e to the mx for every multiplicity you had those if these m's happen to be complex numbers then you had the uh, uh, e to the minus alpha x and cosine beta x and sine beta x, okay? So you had a variety because those complex coefficients, as long as these were real numbers there, they always showed up in conjugate pairs. So you had one cosine, one sine. So that's why you had, you know, that's, 
So you had a variety of ways you might wind up with those, okay? Uh, so again, if you had multiplicity, you're going to have and say that M1 had a multiplicity of 3 or something like that. You would have an E M1 X. You'd have a X E to the M1 X. And as many as you had, you could have X squared E to the M1 X. And you could keep going up until you had X to the, what did they use, K? Or K minus 1 E to the M1 X, okay? If you had a multiplicity of K, okay? And then each one of these would have its own C1, C2, C3, yeah. So you'd have a coefficient for each one of them. All right. So let's try example three, which is going to be just a cubic. So it's not going to have all this many, but it will have at least one that One more complication in it. So here what we have. Y triple prime plus 3Y double prime minus 4 minus 4Y equals 0. First step. Yeah, okay, come up with our auxiliary equation, which has the m's in it, and what will that be then? Cubed plus 3m squared. 4. There is no y prime, so there's no m term. This is equal to 0. Okay. Now, yuck. Can't factor that, that I can think of. Uh, can't use factoring by grouping. That would be a form of factoring. Can't do that. Um, what in the world do we do on one like that? Remember we're back from Math 112? Long time ago, right? That rational zeros test. I always find to be very helpful there generally. Uh, but even before we do that, how about Descartes' rule of signs? What does it tell us? Uh -oh. Long time ago there too, right? Descartes' rule of signs says count the number of sign changes you have in there. Plus to plus is not a sign change. Plus to minus is one you have one positive real root. You can't get away from it. You're going to have one positive real root. One positive real root. Okay? How about the second part of the Cartes Rule of Science? You do put in a minus M. So it would be minus m cubed plus 3m squared minus 4 is equal to 0. What does that tell you? You have 2 or 0. Remember, anytime you have more than 1, you subtract 2 and subtract 2 and subtract 2 until you get down to 0 or something else. So this will be negative real roots. Okay, you may have two or you may have none. Okay, now the next thing I like to do is the rational zeros test. Okay, does anyone remember how that goes? Your, your solutions, your M's, are going to be some ratio of your constant term, well, ratio of P over Q, where P is some 
factorization of your constant term, which would be plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 4, divided by some factorization of your leading coefficient, which is plus or minus 1. So basically, since your denominator is plus or minus 1, you just got those three. Okay? Now, we know we got one positive real root, so let's look for that one first. Okay? You got to have one. Now, it may not be rational. We understand. No, I think it's got to be. Because even the irrational roots show up as conjugate pairs. Okay? So I think we will have one real root. So what's the easiest one to use? One. Okay? Now, when x is, or m is equal to one, okay, hey, we can just plug in, can't we? What does that give us? 1 cubed plus 3 times 1 squared minus 4. Look at that. That's 0, isn't it? So m equal 1 is your 1 positive real root. Don't bother with 2. Don't bother with 4. You've only got 1. Descartes' rule of sign said you did. You found it. But you still got two more roots. So what do we do to find the other two? Yeah, synthetic division. So you do that one on the outside, and I've got to do a little bit of adjusting here because I have to account for every term. That one is your coefficient there, three is the coefficient there. What do I put next? Zero because of the m term that you're missing. And then you got a minus four here. Okay? I like to skip a line, draw a line. If you were in my class, you remember that silly phrase. And you bring down the 1. 1 times 1 is 1. 3 plus 1 is 4. 1 times 4 is 4. 0 plus 4 is 4. 1 times 4 is 4. And minus 4 plus 4 is 0. Ding, ding, ding. You got it. Okay? What does this represent, though? the coefficients of the next smaller term, which is your quadratic factor. m squared plus 4m plus 4. Okay? And guess what? I don't need to try synthetic division anymore. We can use, well, can you factor that? Yes, you can. How does it factor? m what? m plus 2 squared, right? Equals 0. So what is our solution? m equal minus 2, but it has a multiplicity of 2. All right? Well, m equal 1, that's a solution, and then m equal 2 with a multiplicity of 2, that's a solution. So you come up with your general solution y is equal to c1 e to the x that's from this one m equal 1 plus c2 negative 2x that's from that one with the first multiplicity but you got another multiplicity of 2 so what does that produce c3 x e to the minus 2x. You've got it. There it is. Nice, huh? You thought you were through using Math 112, weren't you? Never! Okay. So let's see. Third order, we get y is equal to c1 e to the x plus c2 e to the minus 2x plus c3 x e to the minus 2x. Done. That was so much fun. Let's try a fourth order, don't you think? This one they're writing slightly differently. Maybe it's good just to do it. d to the fourth y over dx to the fourth plus 2d2y over dx squared 
plus y equals zero. All right. Where do you go from there? M equation, auxiliary equation, what would that be? M to the fourth plus 2M squared plus 1 equals 0. Good. Next. First guess. Factor it. Let's see if we can factor it. If it's factorable, and I think it is, m squared times m squared will give you m to the fourth. These signs have got to be the same because the last sign is, yeah, right? Okay. And the only thing is one and one. Let's just see if it works. m squared times m squared is m to the fourth. That's the first. The outer is plus m squared, plus m squared, that's plus 2m squared, and then your last is plus 1. Yes, that works. Can you factor that any further? Those are the same equations, but can we? What would that be? Plus or minus i, isn't it? And you actually have two of those. Multiplicity, plus or minus i. You have it twice, right? So, what do we do? Excuse me. Oh, man. What? What? Ugh. What do we do with one of those? Ugh. You have four zeros, two plus i's and two minus i's. I mean, there are multiplicities there. Okay? So you go back. <laughs> you got two things to do here. Your case two is repeated. That's real roots. <laughs> okay? Unfortunately, these aren't real roots. They're complex roots. But then number case three is conjugate complex roots. So you got two things going on there. Okay? Now. Oh, man. Whew. Let's deal with the, com the conjugate pairs first. So what would that do? For some reason, they approach the other one. I, I don't see why, but let's... Let's do the uh, the conjugate pairs first. Y would be equal to, you can do Y1 if you want to, C1. Now notice there's no real part of this, so there's no alpha. So there's no E to the alpha X, right? So don't even go there. C1 cosine x, because it would be I beta, you know, so that would be cosine x, plus C2 sine x. But, because you have multiplicity on each of those, that would then be, well, this should be, this is y1 into, okay? I don't know how to say 1 into, okay? So your y in general would be c1 cosine x plus c2x cosine x plus c3 sine x plus c4x sine. Now, you don't have to arrange them in that order and assign the signs, the coefficients in that way. 
But that to me is the most likely. You got a multiplicity here, so that gives you two there. You got a multiplicity there as well, so you've got two there. Okay? And I think that's probably how they leave it. Um, so they come up with y is equal to c1 cosine x plus c, they put c2 sine x, it doesn't matter. Uh, plus C3X cosine X plus C4X sine X. It doesn't matter which num order you put the coefficients. Okay. So that illustrates a special case when the auxiliary equation has repeated complex roots. And in general, we do the same thing as we did before. We just, whatever the complex root was, we do an X in front of it if it's repeated for the second one and the X squared for the third one. Okay. All right. They make another little statement here. Of course, this is just about a little below the middle of the page. Of course, the most difficult aspect in solving constant coefficient differential equations is finding the roots of the auxiliary equations of degree greater than two. Yeah, we've just done a couple of those. For example, and here's one. Okay, I think I'll erase here. Uh, 3y triple prime plus 5y double prime plus 10y prime minus 4y is equal to 0. What would be your auxiliary equation for that one? 3m cubed okay now there are a couple of quick analysis of that what can you tell me Name the cart through ring the bell. The cart's rule of signs. What does it tell you? One positive real root. Okay? One positive real root. Okay. You know, you can't get away from it. There's not a, I mean, you, you got to have that one positive real root. Now, I'll tell you right now, it's not M equal 1. Because you can just plug in, add your coefficients together, and nowhere close to 0. Okay? Um, but what are the possibilities for that? Your rational zeros test. So um, P over Q, where P is all your possible factors of your constant term, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 4, over your leading coefficient. What would that be? Plus or minus only factorization of 3. 1 and 3, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 3. So what are those? I like to go with the whole uh, integers first, plus or minus 1 over 1, plus or minus 2 over 1, plus or minus 4 over 1, and then the next one is plus or minus 1 third, plus or minus 2 thirds, and plus or minus 4 thirds. Boy, that's a lot, isn't it? We know one won't work. 
it may be minus Wadsworth. Want to try that one? Good old synthetic division, minus 1 on the outside. What goes on the inside? 3, 5, 10, minus 4. Let's see if that works. Skip a line, draw a line. Negative 3, 2, negative 2, 8. No, ooh, nope, not going to work. Okay, but let's just write it down anyway. Uh, negative 8, and that would give us a minus 12. Now, the reason I wrote that down is to remind you of another one. If these had all turned out positive, that would have told you that would be ooh, it's a negative number, so forget that. Okay, if these would have come up alternate, plus, minus, plus, minus, then you know that minus 1 isn't a, uh, that, that would be a lower bound, okay? We didn't have either one of those. I did minus 1, even though we're looking for positive real root, just because I was hoping it would be something we could use. We can't. So let's go to the plus 2. Now, you'll realize that this might take some time. Right? But we've got time, don't we? Let's try two next. We know one doesn't work and minus one doesn't work. Whoops, I should have done these. Okay, those don't work. Let's do a two here. Next. Six. Eleven. Twenty-two. Thirty-two. 64, 60. Stop right there, folks. Positive here, all positive there. It ain't going to work. This is it. That is your, an upper bound. So don't bother with four, plus four. Okay? Now, we still got our one third, two thirds, and four thirds. So, unfortunately, we've got to go to one of those. Okay. Uh, see the advantage of having the precalculus? Gave you some tools here. Let's do the one third first. Okay. I'm going to stick with the positive ones now because we know got, you got a positive real root. What would that produce? One. Say again? No, it's a plus one. Five and one. Six. Okay. One third of six is two. Okay. That would be what? Twelve. <laughs> okay. Okay. Four. Ding, 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 ding. We've got it. Okay, we found it. 4 minus 4 is 0. Thank goodness because you couldn't do any greater than that. So what we now have is x equal 1 third. That is a root. And that's our only positive real root. But then on the other hand, you're down to a quadratic here, aren't we? So this stands for 3 m squared plus 6 m plus 12 equals 0. Now, what's the first thing you want to do with that one? Factor out a 3. Make it a lot easier. 3 times m squared 2m plus 4. Okay. I know 3 can't equal 0, so I'll just get rid of that one. How about that one, though? Say again? Okay, we think m plus 2 might work. Times m plus 2. What you think? New one. If that was a 4m in the middle, yes, that would have been beautiful. If not, it's not beautiful. 
Okay. So since I can't think of any way to factor it, what might I try? Say again? Quadratic formula? Okay, let's do, see what that produces. M is equal to minus 2 plus or minus the square root of b squared, that would be 2 squared is 4, minus 4 times 1 times 4. Any bells go off yet? Over 2. 2 times 1. Minus 2 plus or minus the square root of, say again, negative 12. Oh, what a joy. Okay, but we can sort of simplify that a little bit. Minus 2 plus or minus Okay, I know there's going to be an I there by that. Okay. 2I root 3. Is that what I heard? I like to write it that way too, not ugly like that because my, my thing go out. But I like to put the 2 out here in the place there because I don't like the I following the radical because sometimes I'll forget that it's inside or outside the radical. So I like to do it there. You don't have to. You know, you could have done it the other way. Uh, and that's all over 2, which simplifies to be what? Negative 1 plus or minus I root 3. Okay? That's what my M's are. So let's get back and see what my solutions are. Y is equal to C1. Uh, and I, ooh, shame on me. Y'all didn't catch it either. It's not an X. That's an M. Right? Okay. Let me get away with that. Okay. C1. E to the X over 3. Right? One third X. Plus C2. e to the what? Minus x, right? Cosine root 3x, there I've got to have it there somewhere, plus c3 e to the minus x sine root 3x. There we have it. One real root, yeah, just that positive real root at that, when we did our quotient and got it as a quadratic, couldn't factor it, used quadratic formula, you came up with a complex solution. So the real part of that became my e to the one x, and the complex part became cosine. Okay. Let's see how the book did. Um, there we have it, I think. Y is equal to C1, X over 3, good for them, plus C, plus, and they pull out the E to the minus X, times C2, cosine E to the, um, cosine square root of 3X. Now that square root ends over the 3, not over the X, plus C3, uh, sine square root of 3X. Good for them, okay? Now, they have a little blurb on use of computers, and you certainly are welcome to use them if you have it. They have a couple of uh, uh, packages there. One is called Mathematica. One's called Maple. I don't know if any of you have used Maple before. I think UAB uses that a lot. Um, and 
for auxiliary de equations of degree five or greater, they say use either insolve or find root in Mathematica. Okay, they will help you big time. Okay, and I think. Yeah, it's not reasonable to expect students in this course to have computing skills and equivalent necessary for efficient solving of equations such as 4.1317 d fourth x d x, d fourth y d x to the fourth plus two point. There you have coefficients that are not integers. So your auxiliary equation is going to have decimal coefficients. Try factoring that if you might. So yeah. Uh, so anyway, go with. If you have the other, use it. Okay, that finishes four point three. Do any of the odds one through thirteen? Any of the odds fifteen through twenty-seven? Any of the odds twenty-nine to thirty-five? Then do either thirty-seven or thirty-nine or both. Do 41, okay, now it says do any of the odds 43 to 47, but what they do here, each figure represents the graph of a particular solution of one of the following differential equations. Okay, so match your solution curve with one of the differential equations and explain your reasoning. So I'll let you look at those. I won't go into any more. If, if those get too hairy, you can probably not get too, but it sort of is fun to try to figure out which ones go with what. Okay, then uh, problems. Uh, do any of the odds 49 to 57, and then the rest are discussion or computer lab problems. Okay, now, when we have what they call undetermined coefficients, okay, um, It's a new kind of problem, and the title doesn't really give it away. So let's just write down the new type of problem. Okay? What's different from what we just did in a problem like this? A sub n, y, the nth derivative of y, plus a sub n minus 1 times the y minus first, n minus first derivative of y, plus a to the n minus 2 y minus n minus second derivative of y plus dot 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 plus um, a sub 2 y double prime plus a sub 1 y prime plus a sub 0 y is equal to g of x. Now how does what we were just doing differ from that? Yes, before we were dealing with homogeneous equations, now we've got a, a function at the end, not a zero. A function of x. Uh -oh. Okay, now, it's not clear from the get-go why they call it this, but it's called undetermined coefficients. Those coefficients look no different from the others we had before, okay? But the technique that's used is called undetermined coefficients. And there's two approaches to this, and it says in this section the method of undetermined coefficients is developed from the viewpoint of superposition principle for the non-homogeneous equation that goes back to theorem 4.7.1, and in the next section 
An entirely different approach will be presented, one using the concept of differential annihilator operation. It says take your pick. Now, since I'm guessing y'all are not familiar with either one of them, just listening to the thing, superposition approach or annihilator approach, do you have a preference? Pick one, either one, I don't care. We don't have time to do them both, I don't think. It's sort of fun to do them both, but I don't really think we have time to do them both. So you come up, which one of these would you like to do? Superposition or annihilator? You sound like building or destroying? No, no I'm sorry, I didn't say that. Which would you like to do? Superposition. Okay, let's go with 4.4. Okay? Now, it says, in order to solve one like this, a non-homogeneous linear differential equation with constant coefficients. Now, it says undetermined coefficients, but they're, they're constant coefficients. Okay? The undetermined coefficient depends on the stuff at the end, not now. Okay? Not these coefficients. We must do two things. Find the complementary function, y sub c. Okay, we can do that. That's what we were just doing. Okay? And then we'll find any particular solution, y sub p, for the non-homogeneous equation. Okay? Then, as it was discussed back in 4.1, the general solution will be the sum of the complementary plus the particular. The complementary function of the general is the general solution of the associated homogeneous differential equation. So in other words, what we were calling our solution for the homogeneous case is now going to be called the complementary solution for the non-homogeneous case. So we start the same way we did before. We start with all those on the left-hand side, but we set it equal to zero. Okay? Then we'll start worrying about the particular solution. So, the method of undetermined coefficients, the first of two ways we shall consider for obtaining a particular solution for a non-homogeneous differential equation is called the method. So this is just to find that y sub p, particular solution, and there will be the method of undetermined coefficients. The underlying idea behind this method is a conjecture about the form of y sub p, an educated guess, okay? Now, let me, I think I've said it before, it's what my calculus instructor or professor told me when I taught us when we were doing, uh, we had finished our five quarter, we were on quarter system, five quarter calculus sequence, getting ready for differential equations, and uh, differential equations was a one quarter course, uh, but we had finished everything, we had about a week or two left. So the professor said, let me get you ready for differential equations. He had had us all for all five quarters of calculus. So he knew us well, and we got finished a little early. So he said, let me give you a heads up here. He said, in differential equations, what you do is try tricks. If a trick works more than once, call it a method. Okay, so what we're going to do now is the trick. And when you see how it works, and you'll say, ah, this is a method. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. The method, it's going to start off being a trick of undetermined coefficients. Later, we're going to call it a method. So the underlying trick or idea behind this method is a conjecture or a trick about the form of y sub p. That's your trick, the educated guess, really, that is motivated by the kinds of functions that make up the input function g of x. The general method is limited to linear differential equations such as one where the coefficients are constants. We already said that. And g of x is a constant k. So this g of x could be just a constant k. Okay? That's going to be one possibility. Not zero, but some other constant. Um, a polynomial function. And that could be 
Remember how they go A sub N. I hate to use A's. Let's use B. B sub N, X to the N plus, let's not use N. Let's use M. Okay. Uh, plus uh, B to the M minus 1, X to the M minus 1 plus dot, dot, dot. You know, polynomial function. You're used to those, right? An exponential function, e to the alpha x. Now, don't forget, confuse that alpha with the alpha that we were using before for complex. Don't, it, this, why they didn't use something else, gamma x, that would have been better, but they use this. Or a sine or cosine. Okay? Function. And we'll call that, and unfortunately, they're using beta x again for those, okay? Or finite sums and products of those functions. So you could have a 7 plus e to the alpha x. That's the sum of the others. Uh, or a cosine plus a polynomial. You know, it's any of those kinds of things, okay? Now, Note, strictly speaking, k, g of x equal k, a constant, is a polynomial function. Since a constant function is probably not the first thing that comes to mind when you think of polynomial, for emphasis, we'll continue the redundancy of constant function and polynomial function. So, even though that is a polynomial function. The following functions are some examples of the types of input functions g of x could be. These are just a few examples. g of x equal 10, or any other number, negative 14, or negative pi thirds, you know, or anything such as that, okay? g of x equal x squared minus 5x. Polynomial function, that would be perfectly fine. Uh, g of x equal 15x minus 6 plus 8. Ooh, that's ugly. Okay. Yuck. Okay. Minus 6 plus 8. I should have erased that too. No. Okay. 8e to the minus x. Now, I didn't see that in the earlier group, did I? Yes, you did. It's a linear combination of any of those. That's a, a, a polynomial function plus an exponential function. Yeah, that's fine. No problem. <laughs> they, they say, okay, no problem. How about this one? Here's a g of x. Would this work? g of x equals sine 3x. Minus 5 cosine 2x. No, 5x cosine 2x. Oh, wait a minute. Time out. Okay. Um, now, I probably said it, but I didn't write it down. We said finite sums are products of those. This is a sum or difference, but then we have a product of a uh, polynomial function times a sine and cosine function. So that's okay too. Ooh. Okay. And let's see, can we get even more complex? How about this one? G of x equal x e to the x sine x plus 3x squared minus 1, e to the minus 4x. Would that be legitimate? Sure, it's a product of a polynomial function, an exponential function, a sine function, and a sum of that with a polynomial function times an exponential function. Yep, that's fine. <laughs> I don't really want to go there, but it's fine. You know, we certainly can do it. And did we just run out of time? Oh, boo this. Okay. Uh, 
All right, I think we're starting then in sort of the middle of the page, 140. And just a little bit of a reminder, folks, as we got most everybody here that's usually here. Uh, in this class, I've gotten three of the four research papers in. Missing one, right? Okay. First test, I've only got three out of the four of you. Okay. There are, wait, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. One of my distance students has turned in the first test. Neither of them have turned in the research paper unless they've come in fairly recently, and I've missed them. Uh, but I've got to check those. But only two of the four of you have turned in the first test, uh, and then one of the distance test students has it. And let's see, how many have turned in the second test? Oh, mine! Okay, so I need the second test then. And folks, we have this week and next week. So I need this, your papers and your second test in this week or next week. Okay? And then at um, a week from Wednesday, I'll give you your final exam. And you'll have basically about a week a little over a week to do it because I think final exam week is the whole entire following week so you can get it to me anytime that week so you have a little over a week then but don't don't wait and pile them all up on top of each other please okay good deal we will see you on Wednesday okay